Yeah, that's so helpful. Brilliant. Sorry, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Um, okay, why don't we get started, guys? And then as people come in, they can. Um, uh, Braden, you you hit record, right? I think, and it's gonna record on my 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 Zoom cloud, I presume, right? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Great. Thank you for doing that. All right, guys, let's get started. Um, I try to cover a lot when we go to campus and and do this. Um, so I do want this to be we have we have a you know um, a small enough group here where we can be very interactive if people have specific questions and so on and so forth. So first. You know, thanks to Braden and team for putting this together. Obviously, you know, I understand there's like, you know, fall break or whatever, February break coming up and all this stuff. So you guys all kind of made it out, which is great. Um, and really, this is an informational session. I'm not here in a recruiting capacity. You know, I will be back in a recruiting capacity and in, in other in other scenarios. But, um, you know, I think in this kind of sense, it's just an informational session for 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 you all uh, to learn about, you know, careers in banking and, and private equity and and, and hopefully it's informative for everyone. And um, yeah, just stop me as, as you guys go. Um, I think I recognize. And so this is sort of, I think our third year of doing this. So with Braden this year, last year, we did it with Jane, I'm oh, sorry, Avni and team. And then prior with Jane Guggenheim and Ilya and, and, and the team. So there's sort of a track record here of, you know, coming back to Cornell. Um, you guys have historically placed very, very well in terms of into the different private equity and investment banking firms. But I think the biggest challenge for Cornell has been like, you know, one, getting exposure to like professionals, because New York, you know, it's not like Columbia or NYU or even Penn, uh, you know, professionals coming out there or vice versa is always more challenging, right? So number one, I want to spend some time with you guys on networking and how to really maximize that aspect of it and really finding your way in. I think that's the biggest thing I feel like in Cornell where you could, you all, everyone here is going to be successful, but you can actually surpass prior years right in terms of getting ahead and sort of being being more successful in the process and sort of the second thing would be just um i think execution in terms of like you know in when it comes to these sort of whether it's networking or information interviews etc um you know just because not every single firm comes on campus i feel like you may not have as many reps right as my like Penn students or some of these other students do and so as a result like how do we maximize the opportunities that we do have such that we have outsized um you know returns or outcomes right so that's sort of two areas that i'm going to back of the mind focus for cornell students on um okay so let's keep going i think um so quick quick intro uh about myself um like i said you guys are part of an amazing organization cibc there's a long track record of partnership between us and 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 cornell um so any opportunity you guys have to get on leadership roles, et cetera, you know, on Braden's team and et cetera, you know, I would I really take advantage of because uh, I think it, it sort of also helps you with your own brand. Um, so I'll go through my own career really quickly and, and highlight some of the lessons learned that I've had. I do tend to speak a little bit faster, not just because we have a lot to cover, but just, just kind of how, how I'm used to speaking. But you need me to slow down, let me know. Um, OK, so my career, I've uh, majority of it. Uh, Today has been investment making private equity. I joined Goldman Sachs and our investment making group in 2012. Um, I so for a lot of you, uh, you know, the first thing as I go through my career, I'll sort of hit a few lessons learned that I want to share with 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 the, with the audience. Number one, I didn't know that I I actually didn't know what investment banking was gonna gonna be all about, right? Like back back when I was recruiting, there wasn't as much sort of knowledge of careers in banking versus PE or whatever. I was actually completely unsure about what PE was even when I, when I, when I was entering, when I was entering Goldman. Um, and I think that's sort of a double-edged sword, right? One is you let the experience tell you kind of how to, how to take it versus sort of feel like you have to pre-prepare everything and know where you need to be four years from now before even you've kind of stepped foot into like New York. Um, I think the other side of it is I was ill-prepared. You know, I didn't really know kind of what types of deals I should be on, what types of industries I should be on, et cetera. And so I'll try to shed the light on things that I've learned over my career that, that will help you guys. So number one, I joined the financial institutions group. What I did know is um, what the other question I get asked, right? Other than sort of, should I go into finance careers? which we'll get come back to in a second, um, is what industry group should I go into? And I think, look, it's someone asked about restructuring, someone asked about sort of other things earlier. Um, I think it's just a function of two things uh, for the most part. Number one is where is your passion and where sort of your interests lie? Um, to me, financial services were really interesting, right? Because when I looked at the S&P 500, um, I've said this on other talks, but like, you know, 50% of the market cap in 2012 was financial services companies. So I was like, well, where else would I want to start? Because this is an amazing sort of, you know, 
part of the market and ecosystem that I wanted to be in. That's number one. So what is what is an industry that I that I got excited about? Number two, um, where do you see a lot of disruption happening? Obviously, for me, like coming out of the financial crisis, the fig was like a no brainer, right? Because every single bank was just being disintermediated. All the lending functions were being disintermediated payments, et cetera. I mean, it's still going on now, eight years later, right? Nine years later, but um, uh, it's sort of, it's, it was a huge area of, of focus. Um, and, and then I think number three is where would I get the most like deal, uh, deal volume and sort of experience. And for me, like Goldman Fig was, and is continues to be one of the top groups, you know, uh, on Wall Street. And so I was like, well, I should go there and get, get, you know, learn from a lot of really smart people. So, you know, people want to ask me about what industry groups they should into. One should be interest. Another should be sort of where is the trends leading you to be such that if you go do that, it's going to help you in your career. And then number three, where can you get the best experience and work with the best people? Um, so at Goldman, I, I did actually was very fortunate. I got to lead um, three of the largest deals that we did, you know, since, uh, you know, since the financial crisis. So I led the largest IPO, which is Synchrony since Facebook. I led its split off, which is about a $20 billion M&A deal. And then about a hundred billion dollar, uh, 20 billion, excuse me. And then hundred billion dollar divestor of G capital. So I, I can speak a little bit about if you guys have questions about types of deals, like, you know, IPOs or split offs or, you know, M&A, sell side by side, et cetera. Um, that's my other lesson learned is in your first two years, right? Regardless of what bank or consulting firm or private equity firm you get into, um, the further you get removed from Cornell, like the less that branch sort of sticks with you and the more sort of people ask you, all right, what deals have you worked on? What transaction experiences do you have? So I highly recommend if you can diligence sort of deals and sorry, teams and groups where you will get good deal experience, then that will carry through your first five years in your career. Um, then I transitioned to private equity, which a lot has a lot of people do. Uh, I actually got the opportunity to stay at Goldman and join our PE group, uh, which is about a hundred billion dollar fund. It's, it's sort of not, not that many people we don't, we don't hire a lot of people into that group. It's sort of, um, it's sort of, I guess, reasonably selective. Um, but I was fortunate I got an offer. I didn't want to leave GS at that point, uh, even though I was recruiting externally. I can talk to you guys about external recruiting in, in PE. Um, obviously, that's a core of this topic. Uh, and then, and then, so, so then, then sort of making the transition to PE sort of brings my next lesson is that, um, you know, I could have stayed in banking and been very comfortable, you know, being a top performer, et cetera, but try to put yourself in positions of, taking a little bit of risk or taking a little bit of like uncertainty or learning something new uh, at different points in your career. And, and we'll talk about at what points those are. Obviously, you know, it's structured for a lot of people going through the on-cycle process. But for me, I, I didn't think that I had to go from banking to PE. I was just thinking, all right, what's the next best thing I could do with my time? And it was like, let me take a risk in PE and sort of figure it out. The other thing I would say is, you know, with Elevate now, I probably see 10 to 20,000 students every year, right? In terms of what they, what they end up doing. And not everyone, actually, everyone thinks they want to go into investing, but only about 50% of the people actually end up being good in investing. And we'll talk about kind of what makes you a good investor uh, a little bit later, but be very cognizant of that. Because the last thing I want you all to do, especially since you're, you know, at an Elevate school, at an Elevate partner, I don't want you guys to like waste years of your career because you haven't been thoughtful enough about your own strengths and your own sort of interests and passions, right? So don't just go into a career like banking or consulting or private equity or hedge funds because you see, you know, someone else in your class do it. I think absolutely for yourself, let's decide and figure out if that's the right career for you. It's not the end of the world if you make mistakes, but it sort of is, um, it, it's time is capital, right? To me, in my life and in, in our careers, I think time and relationships are the only capital that, 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 that we all have over time. Um, you know, because those lead to other sources of capital. And so the one capital I don't want you guys to lose is time, right? So I will come back to that point. Um, and then the other thing is, like I said earlier, whoops, um, I took on a bunch of leadership roles and my lesson learned for you all is try to leave something a better place than you found it. And so for me, that was via leadership and kind of how could I, oh, there's two things. So one is leaving something a better place. And number two was, um, uh, how do you sort of build leadership skills and interpersonal skills because the nature of the job in PE and in mass and banking and consulting for the most part is actually not conducive to leadership early on in your career. Like, as you can imagine, your analysts or your like junior associates, you're not leading anyone. Maybe you lead a summer intern, but you are like the lowest rung in a totem pole in some sense of sort of doing the work. So highly, highly recommend you guys build other ways to build your leadership. I mean, even now, right? Join CIBC, join Cornell Women in Business, like some of these organizations where you can take on leadership roles and affect positive change. Not only because like it'll it'll look great on your MBA application or it'll look great on your like next job, but because you're 
impacting things and, and change in people that in banking or PE in your first two years, you're not going to get to do. So for me, that was like, you know, serving on leadership committees at Goldman, it was sort of leading associate and analyst recruiting teams, et cetera. So whatever it is for you, like make, make that be your thing. Um, also think this whole thing, I've just also, I figured out that I was actually really, really interested in also people development um, and that area, which kind of led me to start Elevate. So let me, let me get, just give you a quick overview. Obviously work with you guys at Cornell for multiple years now. Um, I, I started this in 2019 is, as a way to, can we build, being in private equity, can we build a really strong, robust, and frankly, the largest network of private equity professionals? That's how we started it. Like a few years ago, it sort of expanded, obviously, to a lot of universities, students, um, because I just felt like there's a missing link like throughout your career on how to connect with people, how to build your networks, how to get resources, how to get opportunities, how to you know invest, all that stuff was really, really missing in the landscape. And I was actually kind of shocked that it's it's missing. So as a result of that, um, we're, you know, we have a networking platform, which we'll, we'll invite you all to. Um, there's a learning platform, there's a recruitment platform and so on. Like tomorrow we're having an event with Wharton and the next week we're having like a massive banking panel, right? So it's about transfer of knowledge, transfer of resources from one generation to the next. Um, like we talked about here, we're partnered with, the top 30 universities, about 100 clubs and, and all the top business schools. Um, the cool thing is I think we do have, the, the whole crux is it's professionally built. So all the all the resources you guys will have or the networks and stuff like that are gonna be with with like other great professionals and, and, and places. Uh, I'll send you more info on this guys. It's not, you don't need to like screenshot this and stuff right now. Like I said, tomorrow we have this MBA for, panel. Next week we have an IBD panel. I think Braden's gonna send information about all that stuff out. We have a private equity panel in a couple of weeks and then a venture capital panel in a couple of weeks. So just something for you guys to know. Okay, let's start with my favorite place to start. I know I know there are people in this class or people in this room. By the way, how many people, we just do a quick raise of hands since we have a small group or, or you guys can share with me. How many people here have a pretty good sense of like what, I'll skip the next slide if that's the case, but you have a pretty good sense of what careers you want to go into after, uh, after undergrad. Okay. Um, all right. So every single person who I can see is raising their hand and then most people. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so Braden, maybe you can help me out here. Is the, is the audience here like 24 class of 24? Is it 23? Is it, what is, what is the main, like, yeah. So I'd say between 22 and 25. Uh, as in class of 22 and class of 25. Yeah. Okay. So like all over, like everywhere. So we'll, we'll, we'll do everything, I guess, for you guys. Um, so let me, let me just, uh, let me just go through. So, oh shoot. What happened to that page? Can you guys still see this? Uh, you guys can, you can see this now. Okay. So re really quickly, I'll spend a minute on it. So these are the five most popular careers that people at Elevate go into. So like I said, we see probably, we see 75 to 80% of people that go in, go into, you know, finance and investing careers. The most most uh, popular ones, about forty percent or fifty percent of our audience, goes into investment banking. Um, you guys, it sounds like you're familiar with what it is. Crux of the job is advisory. Um, I will say that at a junior level, investment banking, you do get to work on a lot of deals, but you do not develop. You, you build a lot of good financial skill set, but um, you sort of have to figure out when you're in investment banking. There's three groups of people, right? I with an elevate, and I, I make the same distinction when I go speak at speak at MBA schools. Um, is uh, there's advisors, there is um, investors, and there's operators, or sort of where your passions lie. So something I want you to focus on, even if you do go into investment banking, is figure out if you like the advisory role, which means you're sort of jack of all trades. You 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 sort of have a depth breadth of information across an industry. You know what the top ten firms at any given point in that industry are doing. You have built build good relationships, but you may not have the depth, right, of sort of a private equity investor where you go in and really dig in uh, into a segment or a sector or a company because that's the nature of the job. So figure out for yourself if you like that advisory role or are you more like an invest, are you more into investing, which is effectively like the second thing here, which is private equity, private credit, growth equity, venture capital. I would say about 25% of my audience and Elevate goes into private equity or private credit. About 10% goes into growth equity, venture capital these days. And so the crux of this job is investing, right? So you're not an advisor anymore, obviously. You are now putting your capital to work or your firm's capital to work to make investments into companies. So that is a completely different skill set for everyone here. Why do PE firms and growth equity firms take a lot of bankers is because they've developed sort of a 
systematic way of thinking about companies. They have business acumen, they have modeling skills, et cetera. But that, that alone is not enough, right? I, I want you all to develop an innate sense of, hey, these are business models that I like, or I, I like to look at, or these are interesting ways to operate this company. How would I improve this company from X to Y? Those are the things that differentiate you all as an investor, not just being able to like do a M&A model or, or a DCF model, right? So the point in PE is, it's about finding your edge as a private investor, uh, and then sort of, you know, developing on it. And then it, it focuses on both the financial and operational skill set. Again, I'll get, I'll go, if folks have questions, I'm happy to double click on this. The next segment is growth equity, which I know there's been a ton of interest in. We're going to have on like TCV, which is a top five growth equity fund next month. And they'll, they're going to just, we're going to do a growth equity session uh, with them. Um, and we're going to do a case study of deals that they work on and stuff like that. But I think the, the whole point in growth equity, um, think about like today's market in the last three to four years, companies are staying private a lot longer, right? One, because, you know, once you go into the public markets, there's increased scrutiny, like CEOs don't really want to go in and do, inf you know, investor calls and so on. And number two, private market valuations have gone crazy, right? So you don't need to go to the public market to sort of get outsized valuations. You could get valued as a $40 billion unicorn, right? And still be like series F, series G, series series H, right? So my point is because the the, you know, why is growth equity so popular now? Because one is because technology has, is in the crux of a lot of things that we're working on, but also companies are staying private a lot longer. So what does it mean for you guys is there's a lot more opportunities. Whereas five years ago, every single one of my bankers wanted to go into private equity. Today, it's about 50-50. A lot of people want to go into growth equity and VC just because they're basically outsized returning, right? All of my PE funds. So just something to think about for you guys. Again, it goes back to the skill set that you want to build. What are your own skills? Right? Are you able to work with more established cash flow companies, or are you looking at more growth companies and where you're more comfortable? Um, I mean, these are questions you all have to answer, you know, very soon, right? Once you hit banking, you're gonna have to sort of figure out what you want to do next if if you want to leave. And the third bucket of people, which I won't really touch on, are operators. So first is advisors, investors, operators, um, and operators tend to be folks, you know, if you like consulting or you want to start your own company or kind of eventually want to become an entrepreneur. I think that sort of is is how I to find those three buckets. Again, you don't have to bucket yourself now. I'm just saying over your career, try to figure out which sort of bucket is more interesting for you all um, over your career. Uh, the fourth area, a lot of our, I would say about 15 to 20% of our elevated people go into is public investing. So this is sort of hedge funds, quant funds, you know, there's sort of that line of work. Again, here, I won't spend a lot of time on this on this call since it's not the main crux of this, but here is you're trading with public information, right? So you have to be comfortable with sort of not knowing how prices move and you're going to have to figure out what your alpha is and kind of what the fund you're working at, what their alpha is. Are they just like crunching a bunch of numbers and data to get to their thing? Or are they like having, you know, certain relationships that they're sort of working through the supply chain and figuring out exactly where, you know, certain companies doing or is going to be doing. So what, you got to figure out what your alpha is or what your edge is when the information is public. Again, different line of work. Finally, about 15, 20% of our people go into consulting, which, uh, you know, and strategy, again, you can go back, we've had on McKinsey and some of these other firms, if you want to listen to kind of what consultants do, but it's a much more of an operational uh, strategic uh, job where you're working with clients, but you're helping them transform their companies. Um, one thing I'll, I'll point out, there's certain PE firms, right? Like Hellman Friedman, um, CDNR, right? Some of these firms that are more operationally bent, right? So if you're looking to recruit in that, those types of firms later on in your career, um, you should be able to prove out that, yes, I'm going to Lazard or I'm going to, you know, Evercore or Goldman Sachs or Drake Morgan or whatever, but I also have an inclination towards operations. And because, you know, in college I started a company or I, you know, I did this or I did that. So they're going to really push you on, on why you're an operational, you know, uh, expert in addition to just being a financial expert. So just something to think about as you, as you guys go down this path. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this. I think you guys have a pretty good sense of what the timeline looks like. Anyone who's a first year, um, focus on on-campus involvement, career exploration, and strong performance in your university. Get a freshman year internship, no matter like what it is, it doesn't really matter. Just get something that's ancillary to business if that's what you want to do. Frankly, it's not that, it's sort of the story that you weave that comes out of it. It's more important. Um, obviously my second year is everyone here going through the recruiting process right now. Um, it is intense. Uh, your goal should be uh, deeper career exploration, yes, but also networking like crazy, right? I'll get to this in a second. Um, and then at the same time, like nailing down a sophomore year internship, obviously for anyone who, who's still going through the process becomes really important because that sort of is a barometer, right? That people will try to sort of measure against for your for junior internship. 
Um, anyone who's a junior, um, you know, Braden said there's some 23s and 22s. Um, junior, senior, I think your goal should be to secure your full-time offer, right? Obviously, that's the number one goal. Um, we're going to have a couple panels in the next couple months with people who worked the last summer at all these banks from our leaders uh, at Elevate. And we're going to talk about it. Like, how do you succeed in, in a hybrid environment? Like, how do you maximize your chance of getting a return offer? You know, what are the mistakes to avoid? Like, what did you see other people do that you should not do? Like, all the advice stuff that, you know, we're not there yet, but we'll do it in April for you guys going into the summer, right? And, and you should definitely check, check something like that out. For my seniors, I think it's really, um, and for my juniors, actually, also figure out if your your summer experience is not the end all be all. If you go somewhere and you absolutely hate it, it's you. you this is a great time to re recruit. You know what I mean? If you don't do not like private equity or you do not like consulting or you don't like banking or maybe you don't like the particular firm or the side type of firm, right? Because you don't like the boutique environment. You want to go to a larger firm. You want more of a footing. All of that set stuff is still in in order, right? You, you don't think that your junior year internship is the only place you need to go, right? So there's sort of options to, to sort of not go through with it if, if, you, if you have concerns. And then for my seniors, it's really things like career preparation, right? Like understand, you know, doing all the things you guys are doing in school, like, you know, initiatives and so on. Um, but also like, where do you see yourself in three years and how do you prep for that? And how do you sort of get ahead of that? It's things like taking the GMAT or whatever and getting you know ready for that. So again, that's just a high level stuff. Um, again, for some of my, on, for my sophomores, I'll start with this and we'll keep progressively increasing, right? We'll go to summer, summer internship and then sort of full times and PE. Um, five things that matter to me in recruiting. And, 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 you know, I think over my career to date, probably done 3000 or so interviews in terms of our candidates that we've seen both in private equity and banking. So I can be pretty definitive in sort of what we say in some of these things. Um, five things that to me matter the most uh, as far as a puzzle. Number one is university, right? You guys go to an amazing university, um, a target for about 60% of the firms, right? Just in terms of where they come, come on campus and where they recruit. So if they come on campus or they have a recruiting team, you have to sort of network with the recruiting team. If they don't come on campus, go find a Cornell alum or two or three or four, and then go recruit, you know, uh, uh, network with them and, 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 and go for it. Um, the biggest mistake I think I see a lot of our students make is they just rely on the firms that come on campus and they just like stop there. And I think that's a mistake because, you know, it's sort of like bounding yourself, putting a glass ceiling just because there's a few firms that decide to come to Ithaca, Ithaca or not is, is crazy. So you have this platform. Don't put, you know, ceilings on yourself, rather sort of, you know, let them tell you no, let them tell you, hey, Braden, you know, we, we don't recruit at Cornell, so we don't have any spots. You're like, okay, got it. But I'm still interested. I really like what you guys are working on. Like, I'd love to sort of talk to more, you know, you know what I mean? Like, just don't take no for an answer. Um, as you guys kind of go through this stuff. Um, I'll come back to that point as well. Um, academic performance, again, this is a part that you can control if you're a sophomore as much, right? Your, your GMAT or, or sorry, GPA or SAT is not really that controllable. But I think I would still have stories around, hey, you know, why did I pick my major? Why, why is it relevant to banking or PE and, and so on and so forth? Um, number three is really important. I think internship experience. Again, I don't want to overblow it and put a lot of pressure on you guys to be like, oh, you have to get an internship. But generally, right, how do we differentiate you guys, right? We get 200 resumes from a certain university. Everyone has a great GPA. Um, it's sort of the things that you're doing outside of school that differentiates you a little bit. So it could be leadership, but it's also sort of the, the jobs that you have gotten and the networks you've built, which is why three and four is important. To me, internships is all about progression, just like your career is. Like, let's say you started out as a, at, a, at a small you know, startup in your freshman year. Maybe your second year, you kind of translate that to become a, go to a larger company, or maybe you go to a corporate finance function of a company, or you go try to recruit at a, you know, at a, at a VGVC or a PE firm. To me, that's progression, right? Just showing, hey, I, I like business. Now I want to kind of do a more of an active business role. And then the more important question you need to answer is how are those two experiences relevant to why you're coming into banking or PE now, right? So tell us a story about what you learned there that's going to be helpful in your, in your progression. And that's kind of what I mean by progression. Um, so the relevance is important. Networking, like I said, so much of this can be overcome by networking well, right? So, so you know, let's say you have less than optimal GPA. Let's say, you let's say you have like not a lot of family connections. Let's say you're not like super, um, you know, have a ton of great internships. Guess what? If you can spend 50% of your time networking with Cornell people or other people in the street, you will be able to overcome a lot of those perceived negativities in the recruiting process, right? So I think that's kind of what I'd say on networking. Um, the critical piece is having people at the firm that can pound the table and say, hey, I know Braden. I know... Um, Hey, by the way, is that Celine from Cornell that we spoke last year? I just saw your name pop up here. 
maybe not. Um, anyway, uh, uh, but uh, I think we had a Celine Zhu from Cornell at, at last year's session. So I was just having like um, a little bit of flashback, but um, okay. Uh, but, but anyway, so, so how is, you know, Braden different from, you know, Celine or from uh, Richard or Ben or whatever? Um, you know, I think when you speak to people there, they're like, oh, I've spoken to Braden, I've spoken to Richard, I've spoken to Brent, I've spoken to, I've spoken to Celine. I would vouch for them. And that is really, really important in the networking process. Again, we'll come back to this folks have questions on it. And then finally, interviews. Uh, it goes without saying, but interviews is not about memorizing like a bunch of PDFs. Interviews is about creating or presenting four to five really, really good stories about yourself that shows multiple layers of depth around you in terms of what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, you know, what are uh, things you're proud of? You know, this is like life skill, by the way. These are the same exact behavioral interviews that I'm going to be asking you at a PE or a VC firm, right? As opposed to a banking thing. So I think it's about storytelling and it's about um, it's about frameworking your, your kind of stories. Um, what are firms looking for? I'll just cover this at a high level. We pulled like a hundred or so analysts and recruiting uh, people and we kind of came up with this list. Um, analytical ability. And by the way, we're looking for this across different metrics, right? We're looking for this across your resume, across your GPA, across your internships, across your interviews, across your informationals, all that stuff to form a picture about you as a candidate. Um, analytical ability, right? So, and technical quantitative exposure of skills. Again, you could have zero technical internships on your resume, like no finance internships, but still say, hey, I'm part of CIBC or I'm part of, you know, I'm taking these classes or I've done this on my own to kind of do this. So there's ways you can overcome that if it's not obvious. Um, but you just have to show showcase that that you can exhibit these skills. Um, teamwork and leadership, these kind of go hand in hand. Um, that's why we pick on things on your resume, like, you know, if Braden has president of Cornell Finance Club, then we would pick and say, all right, what did you, what did you do in this club? Like, what does that entail? How did you bring people together? What was the challenges that you faced, et cetera, right? So I think we just want to know how this individual, and Braden, trust me, if and when down the line you were interviewed for PE and you put that on your resume, we're going to ask you, like, in addition to your deals that you have, we're going to say, all right, what were the biggest challenges in this club? Like, how did you get from X to Y? You know, what was the impact of what you did? And it's important for us to know that whatever you guys have picked, right, it could be the tennis team, it could be the chess club, it could be the math club or whatever. Um, you know, how is this person driven? How is this person a leader? And how is this person take initiative, right? That's important. Again, teamwork, we get to a lot around all right, how do you operate on a team? You know, what are some conflicts? How, you know, what's the toughest person you worked with? Tell me about a time when a team worked in, teammate didn't like, you know, carry their weight and blah, blah, blah. So I think we really get to how you handle situationally on a team via those types of questions. Character, um, I love this. At Goldman, we love this. It's sort of just identifying um, your self-ability to just like identify your own weaknesses and sort of failures and challenges, right? So if a candidate comes in, and this is true in PE as well, I think I remember our PE interviews I got asked, or I, I would ask three weaknesses or three failures that you've had. And, and in PE, right, there's, there's like nothing you could say that doesn't make you look like a bad candidate. You know what I mean? You can't say like, oh, you know, I am like too detail oriented. Well, you shouldn't be because your, your job is sort of as an investor. I will get to PE in a second. So you've got to find weaknesses about yourself that are true, but also don't sort of disqualify you right from the job. And again, I can give you some examples about this later. Um, interest in finance. I mean, this is sort of a check the box sort of thing. The questions you get asked in higher views or in interviews are things like, tell me about interest rate environment, or tell me about how like the, you know, current inflation environment is going to impact like X, Y, and Z. So just being in the know, again, go subscribe to deal book and that's all you need to do, right? Just kind of like read it every day. And then, and then you're probably good. Um, I would sort of hesitate maybe from like certain publications that like water it down too much and sort of like, you know, are sort of are not serious about it. So I think just kind of focus on like the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal or deal book and, and kind of just read it for two months. And trust me, you'll speak, start speaking the language. Um, curiosity and communication, I think that's fine. Resume building, I'm not going to really hit on unless people have questions. One thing I'll point to you guys is when I look at a resume, we get a resume book of 200 resumes from Cornell. I look, we all have maybe 30 to 40 seconds of evaluating a resume. Okay. So it's not like we, we spend on like, you guys spend hours on it, like perfecting it, but we spend like 40 seconds or one minute on each resume, right? Obviously, because we just because of time. So try to make it like three or four important things as opposed to like 10 little things that you might have done and try to make the left side of the page really impactful, like led this project, you know, uh, presented to the client or blah, 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 blah. Right. So as opposed to like, oh, you know, a large team of 30 people, blah, blah, you know, like a lot of like this this um situate this uh what do they call it um 
uh, they, they, they do a lot of, you know, description. I don't like to see description. I like to see action and results. So like, just try to highlight those, those in your resumes and, and, and that'll sort of help you. The resume is still, you know, whether you like it or not, like the first point of like, you know, uh, first point of uh, evaluation, right? Um, networking. Um, let me pause here. I, I do want to hit on networking, but I've been speaking like now, <laughs> like 30 minutes. So I want to hear from you guys. Like, what are some of the things that are top of your mind we can keep going. There's like 30 sides. So I, you know, I'm happy to keep going, but I think I also want to make sure that we stop and help people on certain issues that you yourself are facing that, that you want to sort of get resolved right today. I guess I could start that. So some CIBC members have approached me with this question. I don't always have the best answer, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, you know, if you're a, a junior and you're just completing your internship, you know, going into your senior year, uh, if you've just done an investment banking internship, should you be looking at private equity firms, hedge funds to then pivot into uh, full time? Or should you go through the two years of the training in investment banking and then position yourself for PE? Yeah, it's a good question. A um, couple of things I'll say about this. Uh, it's a good question. I get asked this a lot. I get asked this a lot from my juniors who are like, hey, should I recruit? Like a lot of people in a similar question as yours, Braden, like are the, the people you know that you're referencing is like, you know, um, is it just kind of a check the box for my summer and then sort of just go into something else? Um, I'll kind of answer it three, two or three different ways. One is I'd sort of say like, there's maybe three, a couple different buckets of people. One, the one type of person who like for sure knows and they've done enough diligence and about, so, so it all, okay, but even before I get there, it all sorts of starts in self introspection, right? So I, I, I didn't say this earlier, but you will be the most successful in your, and the premise is I want you all to be the most successful as possible in your careers. Okay. So that's why we're here. That's why I do this. This is why kind of why we, have, we work with Cornell and all these universities. Um, let's say that's a premise. Then I think, how do you do that? The, the people that push off the piece that I'm going to talk about, about self-introspection and figuring out what really drives them are the people that, you know, next week, I, I'm going to be speaking at Wharton's business school. And like, that's you guys in eight years or six years or whatever the case is. And they come to me with the same question. Hey, I've done banking. I did PE. Then now I'm at, at a great business school. Now, what do I do with my career? Then I'm like, well, like, you know, the problem we're having is we're not spending as much time like introspecting. I know that's hard to do early in your career for several reasons. Number one, we're so used to like, collecting brand names and, you know, in some sense and saying, Hey, I got to do this and I got to do that. But when does it stop? Like, let's say you go to, you know, let's say you go to a top five, you know, boutique firm, and then you go to a, a fund and then, you know, why did you leave banking? Right. Why did you even go into banking? Oh, I just want to get into PE. Like, why did you get into PE? Is that something you really wanted to do? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because like everyone does it. I make a lot of money, whatever. I think all of those reasons are shallow and, and you will still be in the same place, guys, four years from now. But now you'll just have a little bit more baggage, right? Now you have to tell people, hey, I want to pivot from PE to entrepreneurship. And they'll be like, well, you have zero entrepreneurial experience. So like, no, you know, you can't join a top tier entrepreneurship firm, right? Or, or whatever. So my point is, there is definitely a double-edged sword here in terms of experience and time. That said, banking gives you guys tremendous optionality that I don't think is really available in any other career, right? Maybe consulting is the only other one where you can go in and really, you know, unfortunately, what you should be could be doing in college, or you should be advised to be doing in college. Now you're doing as a professional is that you're really exploring yourself and what's out there. So that's why you see, you know, a lot of fintech firms, entrepreneurial firms, like VC firms, PE firms, growth equity firms, recruit from a lot of the top banks because they know they have that structure. So how does all this impact you all? Is that number one? I would really invest the time in introspection. What I mean by that is it's going to change throughout your career. So Braden or you know Richard or you know Brom or Ben or whatever, it's going to change. But one metric that has helped me over my career is sort of I, I talk about this a lot and in some of our other schools as well. There's three three things. One is what what do you want to become the best at right in your career right? So is the job that you're working on right now helping you get to that goal, right? Hey, I want to be sort of the best investor. Okay, cool. So being in a banker actually helps you because one, you help understand companies. Number two, it gives you the, the platform to go to a top investment firm and learn from there, whatever the case is. So that's number one. So what do you want to build towards becoming the best at? Number two, where do I wake up in the morning and really like get excited about, right? For instance, if I woke you up and said, um, not literally, but, you know, figuratively, like said, Hey, you know, like, um, 
you, Braden, all you're doing today is I want you to look at all of our portfolio companies in financial technology and the insurance company and tell me how they're going to improve. Right. And you're like, oh, that sounds like a drag. I really don't want to do that. I just want to like look at new companies or I just want to talk to entrepreneurs or I just want to talk to clients. Then guess what? Going to an operationally focused BE firm is not your answer. You know what I mean? Like, again, you're not going to have all these answers yet, but my point is, what are the things you, you just get really excited about? What are the things you really get passionate about? Same thing goes for industry. A lot of people say, oh, I just want to go work at Goldman. I'm like, when I, you know, for over the, the time I was there and even since actually, and I'm like, okay, great. Goldman's one of 10 to 15 amazing firms, right? Why, why, you know, wh wh what group you want to go into? It's like, oh, it doesn't really matter. I just want to go in any group. I'm like, okay, well, what, what industry groups are you actually interested in? And they're like, oh, I like healthcare or CRG. I'm like, okay, cool. Awesome. Why? But then they're like, oh, you know what? But I'm, I'm recruiting for natural resources at Goldman. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me because you just told me you don't like this industry group or it's not even one of your top five. And then now you're investing two years into a group that frankly is not really helping you build your skill set and kind of what you want to do. And so you have no interest. Guess what? When you get out of there, you're going to be only looking at infrastructure funds or you're only going to be looking at sort of, you know, energy focused uh, private equity. And now you're going to spend two more years and now you have to go back to business school. Like it's just craziness, right? So number two, focus on your interests and passions and sort of where are you like really, really excited about? Again, you all won't have that. I know you are, all, you're like 22, 23, 20, whatever ages you guys are. You know, I totally understand that, but use this as a framework over your career because guess what? As many calls as I, or LinkedIn messages I get from you all who are undergrads, I probably get 2x those messages from my bankers who are like, hey, what do I do now, right? Should I go through on cycle? Should I do this? Should I do that? So, and I give them some more frameworks. I'm like, what is, what do you want to do? Don't do it for me. Don't do it to update your LinkedIn. Don't do, do it to please like your, you know, person who's sitting next to you. That's the second thing. And the third thing I want you guys to think about is how do you measure success? For some of you all, it's, I want to make the most money. Great. Let's, let's solve around that. I just want to, you know, um, I just want to do like a, hundred billion dollars of deals in my first five years. Okay, cool. Let's solve for that. I just want to build the most relationships that I possibly can. I just want to go, you know, invest a ton of money here. I just want to go build the next generation of ESG, like whatever you define as sort of success impact is for you. So like I said, Braden, it's a long way to answer, but I think I, I, I need to get this point across because, um, you know, number one is sort of your skill set and where do you want to become the best in the world at? Because in today, like we, when you get more sophisticated at a senior level in your career, I don't deal, we don't, we try not to deal with the 90 percentile, bottom 90 percentile of bankers or, you know, operators, et cetera. I want to deal with the top 10 percentile, you know, bankers, top 10 percentile operators, top 10 percentile investors, et cetera, because that's just how the world is, right? Just like, it's hard enough getting to Cornell, right? It's sort of, you know, these are the same sort of things. My point isn't to make a divide between who's, who's good or who isn't. My point is, you got to get into that 10% of whatever it is for you. You know, it's like, you know, it could be an investor, it could be an operator, it could be an advisor, it could be whatever it is. Um, because this world, you don't achieve true, like, you know, clout and you don't achieve true, like, you know, um, able to move markets if you are not in the top 10% of whatever it is. So it's your goal to figure out what that is. So again, my first thing is, what do you want to become the best at in the world? So what is your skill set that you want to build? Number two is what drives you, right? Like, what do you wake up in the morning getting excited about? What industries are you passionate about? Let's go, go after those. And then number three, how do you define success and impact? So Brayden, if you answer those questions for me, and then you're still like, Hey, I've done all the diligence that I need. I really want to go into PE. I think going to banking is sort of just a waste of time because I know I'm going to be in PE anyway then yes, absolutely recruit for PE because then why waste two years if that's where you want to be? If you're like, hey, you know what? I need a little bit more of a structured environment. I don't have a lot of business background. I frankly think getting all this deal experience is going to help me one, solidify if I want to go to large cap PE or middle market or mega, you know, growth equity or venture capital, et cetera, because understand that PE or growth narrows you to an extent. Even if you go to a mega fund, if you go into investing, it's like really hard to believe that and then do something that's not investing, which is why you see a lot of people stuck in stuck is a tough word to use, but stuck in investing for a long time because they don't, what transferable skills do you have? Can you build a company? Can you run a company? No. Can you, you know, like technologically solve some problems? No. Can you, you know, you know what I mean? Like, so what are the skills you have? So you end up staying going to public or private to private to public at sort of a waste of time. So my point is if you for sure are convinced you want to go into private or public, sure, or investing, go for it. I'm going to say all this with the notion that um, it's okay. If you make a mistake, it's your first two to three years of your careers is not the end of the world. You have your 40, 50 year careers. I think it's all a learning experience. You go in with like what you think you know best at and then move on. So, but to, to get to the tactical point that you're making, Braden, 
if you go through banking and you felt like you, you got what you needed, right? Or anyone, like you got what you needed. Um, and then you really just want to do PE for whatever reason, the naturally the PE platforms you're going to go to are going to be more four-year programs, right? Or two plus three-year programs. And so you got to make sure that that's the right fund for you. That's sort of the right environment. That's a learning environment. That's the right sort of exposure. Even if you go to a generalist fund, you may be put into sort of a industry sector or whatever. Um, so it sort of reduces the optionality for you, but also gives you a more tangible sort of thing to do. The last point is that the firms that recruit post full-time, uh, sorry, post summer, traditionally may have filled a lot of their roles. Like the firms that have analyst programs may have filled their roles in summer recruiting already, right? So Warburg, KKR, Blackstone, Insight, you know, the ones that I can think of that, 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 are, that have like reasonably large like um, analyst programs they also have internship programs, right? So you start to figure out for everyone here, like what is feasible and how does that sort of compare to the experience you get in banking? Again, it's a personal question based on your personal interests, et cetera, but also function of what the market is. Again, some people like take the banking offer and try to recruit their, their soft, senior year and whatever firm they land at, they land at. And if it's a better sort of choice, that's fine too. Again, do what that works, do what works for you without being like completely, you know, um, like, don't go out there, like recruit like crazy while you have an offer. Cause that's a little bit of a bad taste. So just say, Hey, like, you know, I, I did banking, but like, you know, cause I don't want to recruit someone who's openly shopping around an offer. You know what I mean? So I think like you, you have to um, be a little tasteful about it. Therefore, I think honestly for you guys, if anyone's interested in that path, start recruiting now, networking now, you know, such that when you get to the end of the summer, you're like, Hey, guess what? We spoke in March. I just finished my internship. Like, I'm still interested. I think I learned a lot, but I'm debating now on what to do. I'd love to see if there's sort of any options here. So it's sort of, you, you have some time to accept your ex offer. It doesn't seem like you're in December sitting on an offer next year, you know, end of this year and still like shopping around. That's a little distasteful. Um, so anyway, figure out what works for you. But I think generally I would say um, it's never too early to start networking, which is why, you know, I tell people like, I, I know like people love being on Finect, the, the, the networking platform is because you can never like network enough in a, in a strange way. Like you can sort of, if you meet 10 people, two or three of them are ones you're going to keep as career long relationships, right? It's, it's not like, so it's not a law of numbers. It's just law of maximizing people that are going to be in your circle, right? And over, over the course of time. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, um, I think, sorry, Brandon, that was a long winded answer, but I think I got most of my points across in terms of what you, I, and this is applicable, not just for my summers, but like, I think it's applicable for everyone because the same questions, guys, I get at the analyst level, the, you know, PE analyst level, associate level, the MBA level. So if you guys can start thinking about it now, you won't, you, you don't have to come to my, you know, Wharton MBA talk when you guys are, are there in, in the next few years. Right. So that's my point. Okay. So let's keep it moving. Thanks, Brayden. Good question. Um, okay. Um, Young Ben. Yeah. First off, thank you for hosting this for us. Um, but I want to ask something more of your personal journey. Um, when you're transitioning from Goldman to now the buy side, um, what has helped you transition? from that guess, advisory mindset to a more investor mindset? Okay, good question. Um, I actually, last year I got asked this question a lot, but this year, because we're in the throngs of network recruiting season, like I didn't, I don't get this. This is probably the second or third time I'm getting this question. So it's just cool. Um, so look, I'll be honest with you guys. And I try to be as honest as possible, you know, with, with all these sessions, like that was the hard, one of the hardest transitions um, that and scaling Elevate has been like two of the hardest like hardest things in my life, uh, like, not hard. It's just sort of, I'll speak about that transition. Um, so for me, it was three transitions all happening at once. Number one, I was going from where I was working in financial services in banking. What happens, especially if you go to a mega fund or frankly, if you go to even like, sorry, a large cap bank or even, even a boutique bank, um, generally for 90, 80% of you guys, you'll get placed in an industry group and then you'll get sort of placed in sort of a sub industry group, right? That's kind of how these large banks work. And even, even in boutiques, there's sort of more of that model, even though it's a generalist model, you will get placed on certain verticals, right? Cause that's, cause we want people who can sort of develop by the time you're a secondary analyst, you should be like good at something, right? So, um, so I got placed into what's the specialty finance and payment side. So effectively like credit cards, um, you know, you know, lending, which has been great because a, I got a ton of deal experience, but also B that was like the most disruptive sector. If you look at where banks post Dodd-Frank and post financial crisis had to get out of, it's all of their specialty lending. It's all of their credit card lending. It's all of their literally payment, like all the infrastructure that, that they'd built so long kind of building up, they had to get rid of because of conflict of interest and because of trading rules. So anyway, my point to you is I was working in like a segment of FIG, which was a very, very hot segment, but it was, it was sort of the segment of FIG. So I had to make three transitions. Number one, I had to make the transition from 
sell side to buy side. You know, this is when I moved from GS IBD to GS PE, right? It's the first time I moved from IBD to PE. Second transition I had to make was I was going from an associate to a VP because I got promoted within six months when I, of when I got there. So like the role of an associate versus the role of a VP is very different. Obviously, thankfully you all don't have to worry about that for a little bit, but I think, you know, the, the VP role, the associate role is really hard. The VP role is a lot harder because now you're in charge of sourcing. Now you're in charge of sitting on like boards of, of your portfolio companies. Now you're sort of in charge of, um, to an extent, um, you're, you're the deal person. Like if the deal happens or doesn't happen because of you. And, and sort of, so there's a lot of different hats you're wearing in PE. And frankly, that's the hardest role. I think the principal role in PE, um, you know, because when I speak to my MBAs who are going to become principals, I tell them that that principal role in PE is the hardest role uh, out there. Um, and then the third transition I had to make was go from a niche of fig to like more broad financial services, right? So, so kind of it was making three transitions at the same time, which a lot of you will make. You'll be making the transition from analyst to associate. You'll be making a transition from industry group to probably something more generalist or industry group to some other industry group. And then number three, from advisory to sell side. So this is not different from all the transitions you all will be making if you decide to go down to the, the PE path. Um, I think the hardest part, number one, was um, was uh, you sort of, you, you are now the subject matter expert, right? There's no filter below you or above you, right? So whatever work you're doing, that goes to investment committee. Like nobody's checking your work. Like you decide, even more than that, actually, the biggest transition was you decide how to spend your time. That is hard as a, as a 23, 24 year old. You know what I mean? Like no one tells you, you I mean, people tell you, you got to be on this deal. But as you go into PE, like I had to decide how much of my time I want to do in sort of building relationship with bankers, how much time I want to do sourcing, how much time should I spend? Like we get 30 deals on our plate any given week, like 30 Sims. We had to decide if we if we're going to spend the time to diligence that company or just toss it in the trash. Right. So um, that level of like quick decision-making that was hard because I was used to being like, Oh, the client says something, let's do this. Or my MD says something, let's do this. And that's kind of what you're, you're taught to do as banking. But in PE, your, your partner comes to you and says, Hey, gosh, should we do this deal or not? I'm like, well, honestly, I'm going to feel a little silly if we passed on a deal, that's going to be the next, you know, you know, whatever a firm or, you know, PayPal. But at the same time, I can't, we can't give capital to every single little payments company that wants to come our way and sort of whatever. So my point is you got to allocate your time between how much information is enough to make a decision and then sort of moving on and make it. So that was, I think one of the bigger challenges for me was one is time allocation. Number two is um, like decision-making and, and it's kind of a short, short, you know, like the, I guess the best way to put it. And then how much data do you need to make information? How much capacity and time do you want to spend to make that information? Like, you know, how much diligence you need to do? I think what that taught you though, is like, the best investors I worked with were able to go through like an information packet and figure out what are the three most important questions about this company that we need to know. So if you guys can develop that mindset, again, that's what helps me, helps you, will help you in PE is take a company today. Like, I don't care if you're a sophomore or a junior or senior or whatever, take a company, go read its MDNA and it's sort of um, risk section. And then ask for yourself, right? Um, what are the three most important things you want to know if you're investing in that company? Put it on a sheet of paper three months from now, go back and see what the next queue comes out and how they've done on those three fronts. Like if you're able to sort of build your own track record around what are the things that are important and how they actually pan out. If you're a sophomore or junior, by the time three years from now, you're an investor, guess what? You're going to get really good at it. You're going to start seeing things that otherwise you would have just missed or you would not been aware of. Right. So I started doing that. Right. So even deals that I would kill, I'd say, you know, I'd call the banker and say, we don't have time to do this or we, we, we can't do this deal. I would write them down and sort of say, okay, like, let's see how this happens. And then three months later, I see that one of our competitors bought them for like, you know, two times the price. And I'm like, what, what the heck, what did I miss here? You know, like, so then we go and try to figure out what, what you missed there. So it's never in the deals you do. It's almost like in the deals that you don't do. And like, you know, why did that happen? Even stocks you don't buy today. I don't, I don't know if you guys have PAs and stuff like that, but I think like, you know, why did you not buy that stock and what happened? Right. I think it just helps you sort of, um, you know, sort of see what you miss. What are your, what are your weak points? How do you think as an investor, you know, what you should be thinking about, had you not been thinking about it? Cause at the end of the day, if you go ask a PE person who's senior, they'll say, Oh, private equity is all about, you know, um, building a lot of reps. And how do you build that reps? Oh, you come as an associate, then you come as a VP and then you build on 10 deals. I'm like, okay, but if you're 25, that's not possible, right? How'd you do, how do you do all that? And so you've got to create a system for yourself that allows you to track your own progress against the things that actually happen. And I think that helped me. So again, it's not a, like one thing that was tricky to me. It was like, one is making the general transition, thinking like an advisor, sorry, as an investor, 
Um, also like running a deal, like the, you run deals as a banker, but you have no stake in the company. Like you just go contact buyers, you contact sellers, whatever, whatever. But in PE, everything you're doing, like you're doing because you're going to either buy the company or not buy the company. So everything really, really matters. And you have to be able to sort of figure out what matters more than other things. So sh should I be diligent in this legal item or does it not matter? Right. Should I be calling, you know, and doing reference check on this management team or, uh, or they check out. So every little decision matters. So it's about sort of figuring out what, what matters more than the other stuff. So time management, resource management, people management, relationship building, you know, all that stuff all comes in. Like I'm telling you guys that transition is the hardest like transition to make again, thousands of people before you have done it. So it's not something to be like worried about or be freaked out about, but know your own strengths, right? Figure out, Hey, I'm really good at this. I'm not good at this. So we got to figure out how to get better at that. And that's what helps my top performers in PE, right. Versus the non top performers. Um, good question. Um, young so man, is that helpful? Yes. Okay. Cool. Amazing. Thank you so so much. I know we have more questions. So the interest of going back to the slides or not going back to the slides, let's, let's take the questions. I think we had Richard and then Ben. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kashik, for all these fantastic answers. Um, I wanted to take a step back, though, and talk about the intern level. So as a summer intern, how would you leverage your network and also your experiences to make sure that you're placed in the sort of groups that you want to be placed in? Okay, so let me get this straight. Are you talking about once you have an offer, like as a sophomore, which groups you want to get, or once you work somewhere as a summer and then you want to go to a different group? Right. So I'm talking about group placement. You get an offer as a sophomore and then you want to be placed, for example, yeah, in the yeah, industrials okay. group. Yeah. So we're going through that right now with like Morgan Stanley, like your class above you is going through that literally right now. What class are you? I'm 24. I'm a sophomore. Okay. So the class of 23 is going through that literally this week, like, like Morgan Stanley and some of those firms are, are asking them to do their rankings. So um, that happens. Different firms do it differently. So I'll just give you sort of a generalized answer and we can talk about it specifically. Um, so it's timely, you're just one year away. Um, but I think, um, you know, the, the couple of things to think about, um, this is the same framework I give my 23s, um, is uh, going back to the first thing I was talking about, right? Where, where are your interests, right? At the end of the day, like, it's not a summer internship necessarily, it's where you wanna go work, spend two years of your career, right? For the most part, 80% of my summers convert into that group and then they go back to that group. But very few people, to Braden's point earlier, actually re-recruit. It's actually, it sounds nice, but it's actually a lot more, a lot more work and a lot more annoying than it actually needs to be. You know, so I think very few people, it's just this is just stats that I've seen over the last three years. I'd say less than 10% of people re-recruit. Um, so summer placement is obviously important because that's more likely than not where you'll place sort of full time and where you'll spend two years, right? So number one, I think is probably triangulation of three things. I was just doing this exercise for my 23s actually a couple, couple of days ago. So it was the number for the first thing was your interest, right? So that's an obvious statement, but I think I'd weight that only really like maybe 25%. Like it's not the only thing that matters, right? You know, I think it matters and for different people it's different weightings, but that's the first thing. Um, but it matters more about what you don't want to do, right? If you're, if you're reasonably ambivalent between, you know, media and tech and consumer retail, then give them all the same rating, right? In some sense, right? So I don't think, I think it matters more. You're like, I absolutely don't want to do fig. I absolutely don't want to do an NR. I don't want to do power utilities, then give it more of a zero, right? So that's one, one thing I'd say. Second thing, the next three things are more important though. Um, one is deal flow, right? So how you, what the, how this process works is you're, you're sort of given a window, right? Let's say February 1st to February 28th or whatever. They say, hey, I need your group selections by the end of the month. It's kind of how it works. So it's on you. You could do nothing or you could do something. What I would do is start with your networking, the people you met in the process and sort of build the relationships because it's a two-way process. Not only are you rating the group, they're rating you as well, right? So if they never seen Richard short of on a paper, then they're not gonna rate you high because like, I don't know who this person is. So I think like go back to the people you met through the recruiting process and sort of, um, or new people, right? Who are in that group. Obviously this time around, you already have an offer. So it's not like you're like some person who doesn't have an offer that like, you know, is now asking for, for, for help. Now I think you sort of make more targeted, be like, hey, I, I think I really want to work in tech for X, Y, and Z reasons. I would love to get on the phone with you to get a little bit more sense as I'm going through the group selection process, kind of things I should be thinking about, just as an example. Um, so, you know, one is going through your network and my, my 23s are talking to like anywhere between four to eight people in every single group to get on that list of sort of get to get to sort of be on that preferred, you know, whatever, like the two, two, two sided list uh, that we're talking about here. So the first is, I mean, the first and really the only, only good way to do that is what I'm talking about, which is like, get back to your, back to your network and do that. 
Um, but then the questions you should be asking them, right? Number one, what are the deals you're working on, right? So great example, tech group, um, I'm not gonna name name firms, but tech groups out of New York are different than tech groups out of San Francisco. So just cause you go into tech does not mean you'll get to work on all the great IPOs or whatever. You need to like figure out what is that, you know, restructuring group in New York do versus the restructuring group in LA, right? So things you need to figure out um, that you sort of get, that's the first bucket or the second bucket. The first is interest. The second one is deal experience. So how much deal experience are you going to get? Because that's going to directly relate to the third bucket, which is exit ops. Again, I'd say for 80% of you guys who are going into banking, you are going in for exit ops in some sense. So you got to figure out what is the track record of the people there that kind of are going out of the firm. Again, it's not going to be any bearing on you, right? It just goes like, you know, Jane Smith got to a firm doesn't mean you are going to get it, but it sort of like gives you a little bit of an insight into what are the types of firms, how seriously is this taken and blah, 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 that group is taken, right? So, but that is also really defined by deal experience. Like you go through and you work in it, you work at a, at a group where there's a ton of deal activity, guess what? You have a lot more to talk about. And then you have sort of better chances at sort of that exit off, right? So to me, it's interest, deal experience, exit ops. And then the third is like, or the fourth is um fit, right? Like if you, if you try to like go and talk to like, the one of the most popular groups, like M&A group at a firm or something like that. And, and literally you're like, nobody's like responding because they're working till 6am every day or, or 4am, then that should tell you something about the environment if that's what you want to join. Right. So there's a lot. And when you talk to people, right, you pick up a lot on like, Hey, what type of culture is it? But there's a, there's a double edged sword, right? You don't want to go to a too much of a chillax culture where there's no work being done. Right. So I think you got to figure out what's the right balance for you and kind of what you want to do. Some people like CRG because CRG historically, because the clients are pretty chill, you know, and like the, the, the firms are also not super demanding versus FIG or TMD where they're crazy. Like, you know, you have to sort of um, what, whatever suits you, right. It's sort of the other thing. So I'd say for me, interest, probably put that at a 25 percentile or 20 percent, you know, or 25 percent like waiting deal flow. I'd probably give like 35 to 40 percent rating exit ops. I'd probably give 20 to 30 percent rating and then work life balance and culture. I'd probably give another 20 percent. Again, you can you can rate them however you want for yourself, but I think generally that's the framework I give my 23s. And then you do that by talking to a lot of people because you need to talk to at least four to eight people, like I said, in each group that you like. Some firms ask you to rate all 12 groups. Some firms ask you to give you only top three. So there's a little bit of gamesmanship as well, right? I, I guess. So that's the other thing I'd say in this. Okay. Um, okay. So Ben, I will get to your question. Um, we didn't get to a lot of, I, I guess we did get to a lot of the stuff I was going to get to um, on the PE stuff. Um, one thing I'm, I will request you guys, um, actually my team is going to request me to request you guys. Um, we have this trust pilot thing. So if you guys had a good experience, go, uh, I think, uh, just say that you took it at um, Cornell and then drop a, a five-star testimonial. Obviously, if you thought you learned something, it takes five seconds. But if, if you didn't learn something or you didn't like it, or whatever, you don't have to do it. Um, okay, so keep it moving. Um, and then Brayden, if anyone has to drop at five, obviously, like Brayden, I will send you the links. Actually, I can even share it right now. Um, I think we're almost full tomorrow, maybe full for the Wharton session. But um, if you guys want to still join, I suppose you can sign up and then I'll have my team sort of open it up again. And then this is the session next. Avni is going to be on this panel. So this is um, all of our student leaders uh, for our bunch of them going to Goldman, Morgan, Evercore, Rothschild, you know, et cetera. Avni, your ex-president is going to be on as well. So she's going to join six other leaders and it's going to be all about recruiting summer success. A lot of stuff we're talking about, but from perspectives of people who literally just did it. And they're, they're also, we picked all student leaders. Um, and you all will be on these panels in the future, I'm sure, but um, who've also guided, you know, hundreds of students through this process. So the whole goal is like, how do we get you guys all to be successful, right, in this process? So, okay, so those are just two things I'll share, three things. Um, ben, I'll get to your question um, now. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, I don't know, chat with us. Yeah. I think one question that's been kind of top of, on, on top of my mind for a while is I'm really interested in like hedge funds. Um, but I think I've heard somewhat like conflicting, I don't know, conflicting advice on whether to try to like recruit for um, hedge funds straight out of undergrad or to like just do your time, your two years in IB 
um, maybe get your MBA and try to pivot from there. And I think I've been a little bit unsure of what to do. Should I like recruit kind of exclusively for IB with like, I don't know, a, like a map and try to go to, for um, like hedge funds later on? Should I look like exclusively at what I'm really passionate about, like hedge funds? Um, and like kind of, I don't know, overall, what should I do? <laughs> yeah, and we may not have all the time in the world on this call, Ben. So I think you can, I'm going to share my LinkedIn again. So like you can drop me a note and I'll try to get you more resources on this topic. Um, just because we we didn't by design cover hedge funds here, but we, you know, we certainly can can lead you to the right places. Um, look, I think, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great point. Like, I'm glad you're already doing sort of the exercise around like, what do I really want to do, et cetera. But what year are you, by the way? I'm a freshman. Oh, okay, fine. So I think the best thing you can do if you can is um, like, I think you need to like put more meat behind like why you like hedge funds, right? And I, look, I, I don't think you need to wait to go get an MBA and then go to a hedge fund. Like that's not needed, right? Cause that's six years, seven years from now. It's not needed. If you really, really want to go do it, there's pathways where there's pathways. If you want to join a tiger cup, you could go banking PE, then hedge fund or banking to hedge fund, or you could frankly do PE then hedge fund, right? In terms of like the types of funds that you go into um, used to be that the banking PE hedge fund was the most popular route uh, pre or post MBA, right. In some sense, but because hedge funds have kind of taken a beating in the last few years, like it's sort of been less popular and PE and growth equity kind of come about. But again, at the end of the day, like I always said, like if you're a good hedge fund investor, you'll be good regardless of the environment. Um, but also hedge funds have had sort of this, like, um, you should go back and listen to our conversation with, I think with two or three Citadel conversations that we've had. And I think you can go back and listen to sort of, there's this reversion to sort of the largest players, kind of the, the, the econ economies of scale in hedge funds, just because how data-driven they're, they're being, et cetera. So I think if you want to go into hedge funds, I need to figure out, you want to go on the trading side, you want to go on the quant side, you want to go on the research side, et cetera. So there's multiple roles, right, within that space and figuring out where your skill set lie. And then obviously what the pathway is. Look, 0.72, Citadel, all these guys have tremendous analyst programs, right, already out of undergrad. So if you really want to go do that, but the problem is, it does narrow you quite a bit, right? If you go to a hedge fund, like the exit ops out of hedge funds is not really that many, you know what I mean? Like, cause you, it depends on what skills you build, I guess, in some sense, but it's like just going to another hedge fund or something. So I think you got to sort of figure out, um, is that where you want to go all in or whatever? And, and when my advice for you is, is, um, I think try to get an in, in school year internship. I know you're young, so you may not pick up all the things. So, uh, necessarily like try to get a school year internship, summer internship, next year internship, next summer internship. So you got four bites at the apple at some type of a hedge fund role. It could be like just shadowing a hedge fund PM or something like that, right? Whatever it is, um, you know, the, I would start with Cornell connections. Again, you might get rejected 90% of the time, but stay with it and let, let get, let's get to that 10% that's going to accept you, you know what I mean? And, and kind of have a conversation with it, but don't start with Citadel. Don't start with 0.72. Don't start millennium. Like start with like local New York. There's, you guys are in the state. So you should be able to get to Connecticut or to the city and target some of those firms that are like more in the um, slightly lower AUM and just kind of see what the job is. But first you, you'd have to do a ton of diligence around why you think you want to do it and be able to talk about it. Show them your portfolio. If you're already trading, like talk about that, like, cause you got to sort of add value. Why would anyone hire Ben or Braden or Richard or whatever? And what value do they bring? I think you got to show that interest and passion and then sort of just be like flexible to the role. Um, I would, I would, I would sort of, not close off all the other paths until you for sure know you want to go down this path because the opportunity cost is a little bit higher on the hedge fund side just because the exit options are not as like robust. Again, you have to also build your data set. I mean, your 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 technical skill set. Like in banking, I wouldn't recommend that you get a sec, pick up a major in computer science or something like that. But I think in in sort of the hedge fund world, you may need to sort of do that to be competitive in terms of more technical background. But again, these are all sort of just more um like nuanced things i suppose that that i would share with you while, while we're here um is that helpful ben? um okay brilliant um okay brayden anything else that you think i need to you want us to cover you want me to cover i think we did a pretty i guess uh like cover all the questions and i think what i wanted people to, to get out of this um right i'll turn it over to you if there's any other burning questions um i have something at 15 after so I can I can you know I can I can only stay till that long but if there's any burning questions I'll take it if not you guys feel free to reach out come to I mean one last thing yes oh cool uh yeah I'm paying. I'll take your question one second but um do take advantage whether it's elevate I mean I think we've curated this platform so we give you guys the best professionals like the best information in a one hour platform but go do whatever you want and learn but I think a lot of times our students complain that it's very black box and then they just don't do anything about it. They just sort of wait for the information to come to them. So I think 
you sitting an hour and listening to a bunch of leaders from X, Y, and Z places is actually going to do a lot more for you than you think, um, you know, versus sort of like, you know, so, so my point is take advantage of these resources. Like I didn't have these resources, which is why we built it uh, when I was going through the industry. So I was very confused, right? A lot of the questions you're asking me, I didn't know where to ask. So, I mean, the thing I will point to young Peng before even I get to your question is this academy that I pointed you guys about. Oh, um, uh, one second. So let me point you guys really quickly to the academy. Uh, so this is the, the videos that I was talking about guys. Um, let me see if you can't see my screen. Um, one second. Um, and the hedge fund point, I will point to you, uh, Ben, on something specific you can even do is on this one. I think some of you guys have probably seen this, but literally like you can come on here. This is just Elevate Current. We have a place for Academy here. So you just need to like go click on like hedge funds, for instance, or, or not even. You just you can go in and sort of, let's say you're really interested in Citadel um, as a hedge fund. You go in and then you literally see like three times nine so 27 videos from people from citadel so you can go in and see all right what do quants look for how do you get investment ideas for interviews um advice to professionals what do you like literally the question you asked me like what are the skills you need to do to be successful in quant careers you know key to success you know what are what are interviews like i think um whatever my point is like recruiting process uh what is it like working at citadel what is it what blah 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 blah, blah. so my point is you don't even have to, I don't even have to tell you, you can just go here and learn from all these people that work at these places, right? So that's my point is that it's about democratization of resources. It's about accessibility of resources, right? So I think for me, that was the purpose here. So I would, I mean, it's not just head funds, right? You can go and say, hey, I really am interested in, I don't know, like um, Goldman Sachs, right? As a, as a firm. And then we have 14 pages times nine. So 140, you know, images or whatever videos of people who work there and can kind of tell you about it, right? So Again, just a resource I really, really has been really popular with our students, but I want to make sure Cornell students also are able to take advantage. Okay, Young Fan, your question now. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo everyone. Thank you again for speaking with us. Um, I'm interested in real estate private equity. And again, a specific question. I'm curious, what sort of like, um, like, the, should I go into like investment banking? Because I've been networking with some people and just like generally, even people in private equity, they say to go into investment banking just to get that deal experience. But at the same time, I feel like it's, um, I don't know, like it, is there a better like sort of like industry to go into, for example, like asset management to get that sort of operational experience in real estate, maybe property management, something like that. Like how would you um, best approach this? Yeah, it's a good question. What year are you? I'm a sophomore. Sophomore, okay. And you want to go to real estate PEY? I I don't know. I I'm an urban studies double major with econ, and I've just always been interested in the real estate industry. Okay. I like from a spatial standpoint and how you know real estate development projects can really change um, a neighborhood or a community. And I've like just always been interested with that. Yeah. Um, okay. I I'm just responding to these people uh, before. I mean, I I was just um reminding them to fill that thing out. Uh, yeah, look, I love it that you're already sort of interested. Have you, do you have any real estate experience already? I don't, but I am interviewing for a VC that works in digital infrastructure. So sort of like digital real estate. And yep. I guess that's the second part to my question. I'm considering whether or not I should take it is for this summer. Um, yeah. But again, like you were saying, like, I, I am open to other sort of industries. I'm not like, you know, only interested in real estate, but um, I, I don't know if it's like so, a waste. Yeah, of look, I, I think, okay, first of all, VC, I would uh, be a little bit wary about just because mm -hmm. like, you got to make sure like the role is actually analytical, right? The last thing I want you guys is to go into a VC firm and it'd be like super sourcing. And all you're doing is calling up a bunch of companies and seeing if they want to take your deals. Because think about it, VC is like much earlier stage. So mm -hmm. you have no data about a company, right? So what are you going to actually be analyzing as an analyst? Nothing, right? You're just going to be sitting there being like, oh, is it a good company? It's kind of whatever, right? So again, nothing... Nothing wrong with that. You're going to be doing a lot more like company analysis, sorry, industry analysis. And this is the segment, segment sector we want to get into. And also you're investing in 10 companies. So that, so that one or two become hits, right? So you're, you're making a more like, you know, random calls as opposed to like thoughtful calls. Again, I'm only pointing it out as, as a, like something to watch out for in the VC side, just because, and, and a lot of people go into VC and that's totally fine, but just make sure that you're building enough skill sets there that like is transferable, right? Uh, over your career and other things. Um, as it relates to real estate PE, like it sounds like you have enough of an interest in both the operating side of the world, as well as, um, as well as sort of the investing side. Um, so I guess I, I'd probably just want you to think a little bit more about 
if you want to go to real estate private, private I still think going to real estate and Muslim banking is probably the most like at least for the summer or a summer, right? The most like tangible pathway to get there. Um, but you can start in turn, you know, you can start kind of developing points of view and theses around real estate, real estate investing, real estate modeling, all that stuff, and sort of interview for real estate PE even before that. I would probably, what I would do, um, young, young Penn is three things. Number one, make a list of your top 15 to 20 or 30 or 40 real estate PE firms that you, that, that would be dream jobs for you and sort of make that list. Okay. And let's go through that. And then you need to figure out like, do you have a pathway into those that go to the firm pages, sort of figure out what they're, you know, you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Like go to the, go to their firm pages, like figure out, Oh, I want to go work at Brookfield. All right. Let's go see like the associates there. And what is the background that they have? Like, that's literally the template and all the PE firms these days have their associates on the website, right? So you can go and literally figure out what people's backgrounds are and sort of see those firms. Again, it's going to take a little bit of work, but it's, I think it'll really help you understand what are all the different ways people can get in and the skills that they're getting in. Number two, I would go look at on the other side, what are interesting ideas or companies and properties that you think are interesting? Because you're already, you're already in the space or you know about the space. Make a list of like the top 15 to 20 to 30 real estate portfolio companies or tech companies, and then figure out who's given them capital and then go like research that. And so that's like a way you can at least get an internship, right? In a way to go get the experience out of there and then get that out of your system. At the same time, I don't know that it makes sense. You said you're a sophomore. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that it may, as I mean, if you're sitting here saying I'm going to leave Cornell and I only want in real estate PE, then I think then you should go all in and recruit for a real estate PE next summer and so on. You will get something. But if you're like a little bit on the fence about, hey, I want to sort of go to the Blackstones and the Brookfields and the blah, blah, blahs of the world, they may not have structured programs that maybe going from banking to there is like the best way. And I think you can get an internship next summer in real estate banking. That's what you recruit for. That at least credentializes you as someone who can do be in that space and then recruit that way, right? So it's a little bit about playing the odds. There's no like black and white answer. I would just sort of say, if you're a sophomore, I would try to do a double dip, like try to get a, get a summer internship for next summer in banking and real estate. And then I would try to get, um, a, uh, 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 a real estate PE internship this summer and kind of see how both of those compare to each other and then try to get something for full time. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I guess an added point is that the VC that I'm, um, potentially mm -hmm. going to work at, it's, it's a ventures arm of a larger, uh, real estate private equity company and they've kind of rebranded themselves into okay. more like digital infrastructure before they had a more like a larger actual real estate portfolio yeah. um so i'm curious like do you think that's still a good opportunity and could potentially lead to i don't know more experience um to real estate rather than digital infrastructure yeah, that's for this summer right right yeah yeah absolutely i mean like i think there's if you're a sophomore year summer I think it sort of checks some of these boxes. Again, I, I don't know exactly what the parameters are, but I think like, it seems like it checks some of these boxes at least. Like that's why you do internships, right? In some sense to like get some experience and sort of figure out if that's something you want to do. I would just get the best internship you can in the industry that you're interested in. So if this is it, then absolutely, I think it's fine. I still think like you figure out and make a decision for yourself if you want to go through the banking recruiting process and if that credentializes you in a sense or you want to kind of go all in on real estate and go through that next next summer and then full-time as well. Again, there's no right answer, right? I, tell you whatever it is you want to do. But if there's some optionality, it may not be a bad idea to go through banking recruiting, especially if you have a summer internship lined up for the summer already. And then if that doesn't work out in the group that you want to do, then continue recruiting for a buy side offer next summer, right? Just in some sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah, of course. Brilliant. Okay, guys, I know we're way over. I'm four minutes late to my next thing. Um, okay. So thank you guys for having me. Uh, super, super awesome to always kind of come back to Cornell. Braden, great job. Uh, great um, questions here today. And uh, yeah, so um, that's it. I'm gonna let you guys go. Uh, I want you all to be successful in what you do. Um, let us know. I want you on all these panels next year uh, from the other side. And, uh, and and yeah, best of luck, keep us posted. Um, I've shared a ton of resources. I'm gonna send the, the deck out afterwards, I guess, for people since a lot of people asked for it. Um, what's some